if a man from Mars, that is an objective, let us say, uncorrupted intelligence, looked at the spectacle of the economic history of the 19th century, he would conclude that the so-called rubber barons were the greatest humanitarians and the greatest benefactors of mankind that had ever lived because they had brought the greatest good and an impossible a standard of living, impossible by all historical precedent, to the country in which they functioned. They were men who took chances on new ideas, who on their own risk and their own initiative created new wealth. They did not use force. No one was obliged or forced to deal with them, to work for them or to buy their products. What then was their crime? The crime of possessing productive genius. They were men who created material products, offered jobs, and offered products for sale. Instead of that, they were tagged bear, robber barons. Robber in what sense? That they had taken from others, allegedly, that which those others had not produced. They were called robbers because they had the ability and the genius to produce their own wealth. The confusion between production and robbery is necessary in order to sell men on statism. Uh, if one makes no distinction between political power and economic power, between force and production, then, of course, one would accept statism and condemn the productive men. Nevertheless, and this is where we have to begin, we have to keep our terms clear, remember that before anyone can rob, there has to be something to be robbed. Before anyone can take over or loot, there has to be property. There has to be material wealth. And the so-called robber barons uh, created the wealth which they are accused of having robbed. This is the worst intellectual injustice in the whole treatment accorded to capitalism. Many historians and social commentators have pointed to the uh, development of the railroad industry in the United States in the 19th century as an example of how uncontrolled capitalism leads to the growth of arbitrary power and the corruption of government and many other evils which are usually cited. Uh, is there any truth to these allegations? Uh, there is no truth whatever, but there is a very important confusion involved in just this case. What we have to distinguish between are the capitalist, the industrialists who operate on the free market and the kind of capitalists who operate with government help. Since the United States has been a mixed economy from the beginning, not a fully free capitalist country, but merely the freest up to that point in history, there were government controls and government interference into the economy from the beginning. Only these controls were marginal and minimal and were not able at first to hamper the magnificent progress of this country. Now, there are two ways to get rich, and only two. One is to produce your wealth and to trade with other people by voluntary trade to mutual benefit, or to acquire wealth by force. To acquire it by force, one must be either an actual criminal or a legalized criminal. That is, a man who uses the power of government to grant him special privileges not possessed by other men, by his competitors, and thus to acquire wealth by legalized force, by the force of law. Well, both kinds of capitalists existed in this country from the beginning. And, and this is the crucial point, all the evils popularly ascribed to capitalists and to capitalism in the 19th century were actually committed by government interference into the economy by those capitalists who were not free enterprisers, who did not function by a competition on a free market and did not rise by merit, or not by merit exclusively, but predominantly and primarily by government help, by the interference of government into the economy. The best example of this situation existed in the history of the railroads. 
For instance, the railroad which aroused the greatest popular resentment, with some justice, was the Central Pacific of California, now known as the Southern Pacific. This was one of the two railroads built by government subsidies. This was the first transcontinental railroad. Uh, if uh, most of you know, of course, the government in the uh, 19th century gave subsidies to the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, two private groups, to create a transcontinental railroad building from both ends of the continent. In both cases, the main motive of the men involved in building this railroad, though not the exclusive, but the main motive, was to acquire the subsidies, not to build a railroad. More than that, there was yet no economic need for a transcontinental, transcontinental railroad. There was not enough freight to carry to justify private investment. But the government, under propaganda similar to today's, and such excuses as the prestige of the country decided to build a railroad, and it did so by means of giving subsidies to private groups. Now, this is a classic example of a capitalist of a mixed economy, that is, a man who rises not by merit and economic judgment, but by government pool and special privilege. The builders of this transcontinental railroad had an advantage which no com private competitor could match. They had government subsidies. As a consequence, the uh, Central Pacific held a monopoly in the state of California for about 30 years. Not only did they have the uh, original advantage, but controlling and bribing the legislature of California, they had laws passed which forbade the entry of any competitor into California. To be exact, it, uh, the law forbade uh, any competing railroad to enter any California port. And since most of the freight traffic came through the port, it meant that no uh, railroad could survive economically in the state of California if it did not have access to the ports. Uh, several attempts were made by competing private companies to break that monopoly of the Central Pacific in California, and of course they failed. Now the Central Pacific engaged in truly immoral and improper economic practices. Namely, they changed their fre freight rates arbitrarily every year, uh, charging as much as the farmers uh, had produced, leaving them practically nothing as profit and barely any uh, seed for the next harvest. Uh, the Central Pacific, having no competition, charged arbitrary, ruinous rates. Now, to whose is the blame in that case? The popular uh, fallacy, with the help of on all the status collectivist intellectuals, has of course blamed the railroads and private industry. The famous novel by Frank Norris, Octopus, denouncing the railroads, was based on the uh, activity of the Central Pacific and uh, was the foundation for the enormous popular hatred of railroads. Yet observe who was the villain in the picture. Not private enterprise, not the free market, but an act of government, originally the subsidies of the federal government and then reinforced by the legislation of California, which maintained the monopoly of the Central Pacific and permitted it to engage in all such abuses, delivering the public into its power. It is an act of government, a special privilege that is required to establish any kind of coercive monopoly, and the history of the Central Pacific is a classic example of it. It was the government, the legislature, that was guilty of the abuses involved. Instead of identifying this fact, it was free enterprise, the free market that took the blame. Uh, if it is asked whether it's a question of dishonest legislatures, it is not. The issue there is that no legislator who has the power of control can be either honest or dishonest. The dishonesty lies not in the person, but in the institution. 
When a government holds arbitrary economic power of, over the economy, no matter what the controls and regulations, they will necessarily be unjust because they will necessarily be weighted by force uh, in favor of one group of people at the expense of the others. The solution, therefore, to the abuses of the 19th century in regard to government-supported or subsidized railroads, the proper lesson to have learned should have been the realization that government controls can create only harm, injustice, and distortions in the economy and should be repealed. The government should not have had the power to interfere into the economy. It should not have held economic power. But since indeed, and so long as it did, the abuses necessarily had to take place with each control leading to further and more disastrous controls. That was not the conclusion drawn. To this day, people have not yet grasped that lesson. And whenever anything goes wrong in any industry, it is always the free market, the free capitalist that takes the blame. And always, I stress this, without exception, if you investigate, you will find that the source of the evils or the abuses was the government. Government controls, not free enterprisers or the free market.